Hey, welcome to Parkway Church's online service this morning. We're glad that you're here. If you're tuning in from Bath or Amherstview, Bay Ridge, we want to say welcome. And a special welcome to you and Helen Henderson that are watching uh, today, this morning as well. Uh, we're glad you're here. I want to give you some announcements right at the start of our service. And uh, October 11th at 1030 a.m., we are going to be having our first in-person service uh, since COVID began. Our first in-person service at the Ambassador Hotel Ballroom. We'd love for you to join us there. You need to register online for that. And uh, you can go to our website, My Parkway Church. .ca and follow the news and events link and it'll lead you to a place where you can register for our service. You need to pre-register to be allowed in. We want to follow all uh, of the uh, government regulations that are being provided to us uh, by the federal provincial government. I uh, want it to be a safe and enjoyable experience for you. So you need to pre-register for that if you're going to be part of it. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be family friendly. There's going to be great stuff uh, at it for your kids as well, families. You're going to be able to sit at a table with your family. There'll be some things there for your kids to do as well during service. Uh, it's going to be a great time together. So make sure you register for that. It'll be a great time to celebrate being together uh, during the Thanksgiving season. So be part of that. Also on our website, if you're part of our directory, there's other things coming up, other announcements that'll be there for you as well. So make sure you check those out. For everybody, tell everybody in the neighborhood, let everybody know November 13th to the 15th. We are having a second, we did one earlier in the summer, a second online conference called Believe. Uh, great speakers sharing at it. Dr. Aaron Perry, he uh, is a teacher at Wesley Seminary, Seminary in Indiana. Dr. Steve Lennox is president of Kingswood University in Sussex, New Brunswick. He'll be sharing. And a really special guest, uh, Pastor Mark Clark from the Village Church in the greater Vancouver area. I'll be interviewing him on the Saturday night of the conference. Uh, the conference is called Believe. It is geared towards answering some heavy, hard questions you may have about the faith. Maybe you're skeptical about Jesus, about God in general. Uh, let your friends know, some of your friends who are atheists, agnostics, people around you uh, who don't have a relationship with Jesus. This is going to be a great thing for them to tune into, to, to really dig through history, dig through science, dig through the scriptures together. Uh, Believe Conference, November 13th to the 15th. Uh, same thing, register online. Uh, you can tune in every night and just watch if you like, but if you register, we'll enter your names in uh, for some nightly prize draws during the conference. We want to give some of the uh, some books away from the people who are speaking. They're all authors, so it's going to be great to give those to you as well and some great door prizes uh, at the conference. Tune in, grab a coffee, uh, join in this morning or this week, whenever you're watching. We're glad that you're here. Let 
chains. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing. Chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine shadow where I hide the ransom for my life always oh, my soul you are good good oh you are good good oh you are good King of my heart, be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, always oh, my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, always oh, my song. You are. Verse 2, it says, Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. He is my song. The echo, the echo of my days. And uh, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing at the end of our lives that the main thing that would be remembered about us was Jesus and nothing else. The king of the, my heart be the wind inside my sails. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in my waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, 
always my song For you are good, good Oh, you are good, good Oh, you are good, good Oh, you are good From the outside, we may look like just a building. But how could brick and stone, wood and glass represent a people? Let me tell you who we are. We are those who have found and accepted a life of forgiveness and love We strive to live a life that honors our Father in Heaven. We are called to serve the hungry, the hurting, the broken. We are a body, each of us a part with a unique purpose and a role to play. We will go wherever needed, serve however needed. We will show the world that who we are isn't nearly as important as whose we are. We, the church. Hey, let's pray. We'll get into the Word this morning. This is the first uh, teaching uh, in the We the Church series that we're starting. And uh, let me pray for us as we dig into the Word. Father, thank you so much uh, for your scriptures. Thank you so much for the book of Revelation, God. It's a, it's a challenging book in scripture. It's an encouraging book in scripture, Lord. 
Pray that you'd speak to us today as we dive in. And Father, that you would help us to become the church uh, that would give glory to your name, that would bring the most honor to you, that would be a church uh, after your heart, God. And uh, Father, would you speak to every one of us today about what that means in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's, uh, it's no surprise right now in the middle of COVID, when you look uh, around the world, look at the news in the United States, Canada, uh, the, some of the chaos that's going on connected to everything, we pray for our nation, pray for the nation uh, south of the border, and uh, it's no surprise that churches all over North America are, are shifting right now and having to rethink what it means to be the church, what it means to meet together all of these things. And we're going to be talking to you these next couple of weeks, unpacking some of those things as we look through the book of Revelation. And uh, this is the first, uh, the first teaching in the We the Church uh, series. Uh, I'm excited about this. I'm excited for us to kind of have a conversation a little bit about the nature of the church, uh, the church that way Jesus intended it to be. And I'm excited to bring the word to you. I don't know if you uh, watched, uh, watched, if you're a sports person, you were tuned into this last year, but last year when the Toronto Raptors uh, finally won the NBA championship, uh, a bunch of us, including myself, who don't watch basketball very often, were suddenly sort of sucked into uh, watching the Raptors go to the final and the excitement about it. I remember uh, driving through Toronto leading up to that uh, one time and seeing the We the North banners around the, the, the city. And uh, that catchphrase of, of pulling together something unique and special about basketball in Canada. Uh, there was, a, uh, there was a, you know, a consulting advertising firm uh, in charge of actually that mantra, that logo, We the North. We the North, if you remember. And uh, one of the people that helped us, uh, you know, come up with sort of that catchphrase to describe Canadian basketball, in particular the Raptors, he said, we weren't just branding the Raptors, we were branding Canadian basketball. And uh, it's a long-known sort of thing that uh, it's been sort of murmured about and spoken about that NBA basketball players, there's a little bit of a reservation that some have had about coming to play in Toronto. Uh, it's the only Canadian city in the NBA. You have to go through customs all the time to play those other teams in the States. Uh, there's a sense of isolation a little bit. Uh, being in Canada, it's cold. We know this, right? Uh, and, and also, you know, Toronto in lots of ways, uh, as far as basketball, yeah, has been ignored a little bit by the American media. And uh, this, this whole We the North campaign slogan was to sort of capture something unique about the game in Canada. I watched a video this week that was sort of connected to the promotion of We the North describing Canadian basketball. It was sort of this artistic uh, presentation of basketball in Toronto. And you, 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 know, you, you see snow and ice and barrels of fire, people playing, uh, playing in the dark and the cold in Canada. You see a wolf, you see maple syrup flowing down the court. No, you don't see that. But you see all these iconic Canadian things uh, coming together to try to give sort of an image of what basketball is in Canada. It became this rally cry uh, for, for, all, for, for Canadians as we cheered for the Raptors going into the final, We the North. The video sh showed uh, intentional sort of classic Canadiana things attached to basketball, We the North. Today we're talking about We the Church. What does it mean to be the church? If, if they were to make a video if they were to make an advertisement, and listen, the church is not a business, but imagine with me for a bit, if they were to make a video de describing the church like Jesus intended it, what kind of images would be in that video? When I think of a few of the things, and you know, you would add some things to this, this list isn't complete, but I think of how Jesus was and how the church was at its, at its inception. The church would be a haven for broken and lost people. Uh, somebody in our prayer meeting, our Parkway prayer meeting, uh, said this this week as they were praying for our church and praying for the church in, in Canada and the greater Kingston area. She described the church like a powerhouse, a powerhouse for the miraculous, filled with God's ambassadors for the planet, people sharing his truth, living his truth, living his kingdom and his redemption. The scripture says this about people in Jesus' church. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassadors 
on the planet as if God were making his appeal to the planet through us. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. We're the church. We're the church. And imagine if the church in Canada, if the church in Kingston, if Parkway Church uh, became the church that would bring a smile to Jesus' face by our behaviors and actions, by our faith, by our moving forward in the kingdom to share his glory with the planet. We can also imagine, and you know, unfortunately, you can probably do this if you've been around the church a little bit in your life. We can also imagine the church at its worst. Can you think of a few things? You know, I bumped in more into more than one person uh, through the years as they find out that I'm a pastor that'll say things like, oh, you know, the church is full of hypocrites. They, they don't look or act like Jesus, you know, starts listing sort of, uh, you know, things, things off that they have against the church in general. And, uh, you know, the, the problem with the church when we're at its worst is, is because the, re- the reason why the church has problems, the reason why there's hypocrisy is that the church is full of people. And we are, we are imperfect human beings pursuing a, a perfect God. And I'm so thankful for the salvation that Jesus has bestowed on me, not because I am good or great, because I have put faith in his son, Jesus Christ, to save me from sin and death and hell. The church is imperfect because it's full of imperfect people. That's the baseline. But unfortunately, through history, Through different times, a church full of imperfect people trying to live out gracious lives before God and trying to follow him closely can decay to something even worse. The church has in the past sometimes lost the truth, lost its love for God or for the people around it. And sometimes the church has even lost Jesus entirely. I'm going to read a scripture today. We're going to look in Revelation And uh, the the scripture that we're reading out of Revelation, it is a scripture calling the church to be the the church that Jesus desires. And uh, before I read the scripture today out of the book of Revelation, I know when I say Revelation, some of you like are getting excited because you love reading through Revelation. It's your favorite book. Some of you are like, oh man, that's the book I avoid because it's terrifying, spooky, crazy, like all the, the thoughts that you may have about it. But today as we look in, I want to share a couple things about the book of Revelation before we dig in. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic writing. In the Old Testament, there were prophets all through the Old Testament that that would often tell Israel and and warn Israel about the sin they had committed, the sin they were diving into, would warn them and say, you know, you're diving into sin. Things are not going to go well for you. God's judgment's going to come upon you. Uh, There would be warning in it. There would be confirmation that a calamity had come upon them because of this reason, because of their sin. There was God's judgment on them. That was a role of a prophet. In the middle of it, there was a warning about sin, a call for Israel to repent, letting them know that there was a calamity, a bad thing that was falling upon them. And often the prophet would would tell Israel, Israel about an ultimate victory that would happen in the future. The Jewish people would always divide their timelines into this, the age that they were presently in and the age that was to come. It was out of these moments that the earliest, you know, all through the prophets, uh, forecasts and prophecies about the arrival of Jesus the Messiah came. They were in terrible mess, calamity, being disciplined by God, being led away into captivity. And God would speak to them about the age to come where the Messiah would come and deliver the Jewish people. And I want to tell you this morning, as we look into Revelation some, don't don't be afraid about reading prophecy. The Old Testament prophesied Jesus' arrival, his virgin birth, his death, his resurrection, his ministry, all these details, these 40 or so very intentional prophecies. Some say up to 300 larger prophecies. The list goes on and on out from there. But prophecies about who the Messiah was, what he would do, what he would accomplish— And Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. There is also 
hundreds and hundreds of prophecies about Jesus' return, about his millennial reign on the earth, about the judgment of mankind. If Jesus fulfilled the prophecies about his original coming and ministry on this earth, the scripture is going to reign supreme in forecasting his return to this earth to bring his church home, to bring his bride home, and to pass judgment on those who have rejected Jesus and rejected tr- truth and rejected God. There are prophecies about that and Revelation. Don't be afraid as we dig in. It's a beautiful book. If you read in Revelation, you'll see at the start of the beginning, you know, uh, uh, a sort of call out to say, read this book aloud. Be, you will be blessed when you do. Blessed are those that read the words of this book and, and store them up in your heart as you do that. There is a blessing that will come as we dig in to this book. The book is for us to learn and grow. Now, some of it, uh, the, the writing of Revelation was addressed to the churches at the time it was written, those first few chapters. And some of it is containing descriptions of things in the future. Revelation confirms this. Revelation 1.9 says this, John has this vision where he sees Jesus and Jesus speaks to him, unveils the revelation, the unveiling, unveils this picture before him of what will happen in the future. But he, he gives sort of a precursor this way. Revelation 1.9, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, what is now, and what will take place later. These first few chapters, these admonitions to seven churches in, in Asia, these first few chapters, I really believe, and if you, if you have a different take, and this is why some preachers are scared to speak on Revelation, because there's a lot of different views on parts of it, uh, my take on the description of God's uh, speaking to these seven churches, of speaking truth to them, is that this really is God's warning, God's encouragement to these seven churches that were in literal places in Asia, in modern-day Turkey that it was for them then. We can learn from it now. God can speak to it, speak truth into our lives about what it means to be part of the church and be the church right now. But there was a message for those individual churches then. I don't believe personally that those churches are representative of ages. I know there's some revelation revelation teaching that would say, you know, uh, that, that each of the churches from those cities represents a different epoch or different age of the church's history. I don't see particular evidence for that personally. If you believe that, we can disagree on it. That's okay. Revelation is a great book uh, to read and, and talk about and discuss. I really do believe that in these first few chapters of Revelation, there is an admonishment, an encouragement, a rebuke given to seven churches, personally given to each of those churches. They were all a little different. They all had different things going on inside of them. And we're going to read Jesus's first admonition to the church in Ephesus. Now, before I read the scripture, I, I'm used to, I used to say this a lot, so we're meeting more publicly. This is a long introduction to a, to a short message. Before we dig in a little further, I want to give you a little precursor to the passage. In our Western culture, we always, even in church sometimes, talk about God speaking to us through his Holy Spirit individually. And I think one of the things that's beautiful about the passage that I'm about to read is, this is God speaking to a local church. We always assume it's just for us personally, but God has a word for a local church in a city. Can you imagine that? If we were to contemporize this right now, it would be God speaking, giving a word, Jesus saying, I have a word for the church in Toronto or the word in, a word for the church in Oshawa, Belleville, Napanee, Kingston, Brockville, Amherstview. He would be giving uh, a word and encouragement to a local church as a group. And another thing I want to speak to you about before we actually read it, he's speaking to a church in an individual community. I'm not just reading this today as, as, a, as Jesus, you know, speaking into a Baptist church or a Pentecostal church or a Wesleyan church or a Methodist church. He's speaking into one church within a city. That church would have been meeting in, in multiple households, likely around the city, in public spaces, in households, in private places, meeting in all sorts of different ways. But he was speaking to one church in one city. Could you imagine with me what Jesus' word would be today to his church in Kingston? 
I'm talking all of us. I'm a pastor in a local body of, of believers within the greater Kingston area. But what would his word be for all of Kingston? That's kind of what we're reading today. The word for the church in Ephesus. And may God speak to us today as we, we dig into it. Take a look at Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to read Jesus' word to this first church. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. And earlier in Revelation, you're given this beautiful image, this sort of spiritual image of Jesus interacting with the churches and the lampstand representing the church. Who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. You have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. The description of this church, the first thing that that Jesus speaks into this church are the great things that they are doing. They've done great deeds. You know, the scripture says, uh, do great deeds before men that, they may glor- they, that those people may glorify the Father in heaven. They're doing great deeds, hard work. They're persevering in this. This is, a, this is the church uh, that was feeding the homeless, that was looking after orphans and widow. They were, they, their, their faith had an effect. It wasn't just sort of saying they believed in Jesus. They, they were loving. They were doing good things in the community. They were doing great things. And it also says this about them said, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. There's, there's a sense that this church, and you could picture it happening. Imagine all these house churches, and all of a sudden, somebody is maybe taking leadership over one, or somebody's speaking in that one, and all of a sudden, they start teaching, and what they're teaching is, is, is false teaching. It's not biblical. It doesn't match what the apostles had shared, the eyewitnesses had shared about Jesus, and they basically have tested these people who are claiming to be leaders, claiming to be spiritual leaders and apostles, and found them false. The scripture says this about this sort of hub of what it was meant to be like in these local churches in the city. This is what it says in Ephesians. Christ gave himself, Christ himself, sorry, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14 says this, and this is Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. It says that in a local church body in a city, these people using their gifts, pastors, teachers, evangelists, people using their gifts, it said that in the middle of this, all of us, because of everybody using their gifts Together, we might reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, verse 14 says this, Ephesians 6, sorry, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people, people in their deceitful scheming. And I hope you caught this, this little side note here. We're reading Jesus's word in Revelation to the church in Ephesus, and now we're reading an earlier letter to the Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus. They must have taken Paul's word to heart. They must have taken Paul's word to heart. They'd received a warning that there would be a temptation to be blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. They were warned that there would potentially be false doctrines being taught by false people within their church. Within their church. They were warned ahead of time. So this church in Revelation, this Ephesian church, they were doing great in the community. 
they, they obviously had things with the elements within their church that were teaching falsely, things not going well, leaders maybe teaching the wrong things or outsiders coming in and trying to deceive the local church. And they had dealt with these people. They had, they had to get rid of <laughs> these windy teachings, all right? It says people that are immature, they'll be blown about by every, by every wind of teaching. They had to get rid of some windy teachings in their church. False teaching almost always applies to one of these areas, and all of the areas appeal to our human nature. If, if you were sitting under false teaching, if, there's, if there's, there's, a, there's a teaching within the church that has fallen off the track from the centrality of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it often goes this way. There is a theology, a way of teaching, or, or, or a doctrine that would be watered down to make it more acceptable to the world. To make it more acceptable to the world. You know, Christians oftentimes get, get, you know, get sort of called out or hollered at for being judgmental on the world. But, but in, in the very nature of the truth uh, of a sinful human being receiving truth from God, the, the scripture ends up judging us. It ends up revealing our sin nature. And that is a very uncomfortable thing. There's a false teaching that would, would emerge that would make the gospel more acceptable to the world. There is a, a false teaching on God that appeals to our sinful nature that would be low on morality. God loves everybody so much. Do whatever you want. That's not what the scripture says. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. And your sin is so bad that it cost the blood of Jesus on the cross. Your sin matters. There would be a false teaching that would appeal to our sinful nature and be low on morality and holiness. There would be a false teaching that appeals to our pride, all works and no spirit, meaning I can just list off all these great things I do as a Christian. I don't do that. I don't smoke or chew or run with girls that do. It used to be an old saying from when I was at camp of, of, of sort of exalting you as a person in your good works and your good deeds and having no redemption by the blood of Jesus in it. And if you are going to church right now or part of a local church and you think that all being a Christian means is that you live a good life, you have missed the point. You are a sinner that needs a savior named Jesus Christ. Everything hinges on that. There's a false theology that, that appeals to the desire for me to prosper, a prosperity gospel that really God has come, that I might be healthy, wealthy, wise, all of these things, and, and, and would be low and unable to teach us on suffering. And there would be a theology, and this is very, be very careful on this, there would be a theology or a false teacher that would elevate the teacher above the message, that would elevate the teacher above the message. I always get a little spooked by a person who comes to me and says, the only teacher I ever listen to is this guy online. They don't listen to any other preacher. They don't. Danger. D danger to just have one person speaking into your life and to not even be able to study the scripture on your own. I'm also a little nervous sometimes. I want to let you know that I listen to other preachers too. I get fed. I, li I listen to speakers. I listen to pastors. I, I read books that other Christians have written. And, and, and just hinging all of your life on one teacher, a theology that elevates the teacher above the message. I'm also equally concerned if, if somebody shows up in my midst and suddenly reveals to me somebody claiming to be a teacher and, and saying that they have discovered a new thing in scripture. There's a flag that goes up immediately. The, 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 the New Testament, the Bible has been here for thousands of years. Now there are teachings in the Bible that, that sometimes can be lost during certain eras of church that maybe we were really focused on, on doing good in the neighborhood and loving people and, and had forgotten a teaching on holiness and it gets centered on a certain thing. Or maybe there was a different era where we really get focused on, on holiness and the cross and it didn't translate into action in our community or sharing the love of God. There can be things that sort of can be lost and are ignored, but the word of God remains. There's not some sneaky, mysterious truth that one person is going to know and all the other teachers won't. Flags go up when somebody claims to have special knowledge from God, 
that others cannot have. There's a theology that elevates the teacher above the message. Why am I going down this rabbit trail with you? In this church in Revelation in Ephesus, they had to expose, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not, and have found them false. This is a lead up to the real admonition of what God wants to speak to us today. There is an exhaustion that can come upon a church, an exhaustion of the leadership within that church, having to defend the faith, having to rebuke those who are teaching wrongly, teaching in an antichrist way. There is an exhaustion that can come upon a church of having to remove people from leadership. There is an exhaustion that can come. There is an exhaustion that can come from having to defend the sheep and chase away the wolves. There's an exhaustion that can come upon leadership in a church like that. An exhaustion that can come upon the people who have seen even families divide up because of these things. Families and fellowships and normal routines by having to expose these sorts of things in the church. And this ties in to Jesus' admonition to them. You're doing great things in the community. You're loving people. You're not going to tolerate false teaching. You want the pure word of Jesus Christ. You're, you're holding on to these things. You've even exposed the false teachers. You've sent them away. And then this is what Jesus says to them. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at the first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at the first. You have forsaken the love you had at first. There is an exhaustion that can come when dealing with difficult people situations within a body that can bring the love of Christ in your heart down to this dull sort of flame inside of you. There is an exhaustion to it. And he gives, Jesus gives an answer to a church that has lost its love. You have forsaken the love you had at the first. God's answer for that sort of downfall in the heart of that kind of church. The first one is this. Consider how you have fallen. And, and I, uh, my prayer for you this morning, if you're sort of in this category that you are low on love, this first church, we're talking about a church that loves in a fresh new way today. If we're going to be his church, the church that brings a smile to Jesus' face. Consider how you have fallen. Do you remember when you became God's child to begin with? Do you remember when you were saved? Keith Green said it's like waking up from the longest dream. He thought he had had it all right, and it all came shattering down when he found Jesus. I remember when I became a Christ follower, and I was beautifully and irresponsibly distracted by him. It affected my schoolwork. It it affected my friendship. It affected the direction of the rest of my life. It was a beautiful, crazy interruption into everything that I was. There is a honeymoon stage in that relationship with Jesus. The song of a soul set free. Forgiveness of your sins, freedom, purity, new life that started inside you. Romans 5 5 says that God has poured out his love into your heart through his Holy Spirit. And God's answer to a church that's lost its love is to consider how far you have fallen from those early days. I was reminded this week of of when God began to work in my heart that way, there was other people in our friend group and our youth group that had gone through this revival and transformation as well. Uh, I was back at my home church that I went to youth group in uh, a couple summers ago, and I, I was actually going in to see if the original stage was still there. Uh, it, it's not. It's been torn down. The church has grown a lot since then. It's a, it's a much larger building, but the original stage is gone. And the four or five of us that had had this encounter with Jesus and the, the, our lives had changed so dramatically by God, we used to open up the hatch in the stage after school or before youth group and go underneath the stage and spend time in prayer with each other before youth. 
We'd written prayers in Sharpie marker on the wall. We'd written our names there underneath on the, the, you know, the, the wood holding the stage up underneath the stage. God had beautifully interrupted our lives and we, we couldn't turn back. And as we grow out of the honeymoon, our relationship with Jesus can become pretty contrived. Sometimes we can even be doing ministry or doing things for God, like this church earlier in, in, in Revelation 2, the Ephesian church, doing things for God and no longer having any joy in Jesus himself. And God calls us to remember how far we have fallen, how far we've fallen from that original state. I was watching a, uh, a YouTube video this week, a courtroom sort of drama kind of thing. Now, it was a real life drama, a court, courtroom footage. And uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful thing. You can type it in later if you want to see it. It's really powerful. Judge Mindy Glazier was the presiding judge when a man named Arthur Booth sort of comes, it's on video, comes before the judge and she's working out sentencing and all these things and he's sitting there in his prison uniform, right? Uh, waiting to hear from the judge and the judge looks at him and says, hey, did you go to Nautilus Middle School? And, and this man realizes that the judge, he and the judge had gone to the same school and their lives had gone totally different directions. And you can see it in his face. He says, one, oh my goodness, when he realizes who the judge is. The first, oh my goodness, was, I recognize you. And there's a smile that comes. Wow, it's somebody, I, a friend from earlier in life. The second, oh my goodness, that he says out loud is heartbreaking. It turns from a smile to a cry as he slumps over the stand. The second, oh my goodness, is, I remember my old self back then in junior high school before I was sitting in this courtroom for the crime that I've committed. There is something about looking back. Now, the scripture tells us often, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who the joy, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The scripture tells us to look, fix your eyes on Jesus, to be looking forward. But there's times where the scripture tells us to look back and remember the beauty of those early days with Jesus. When things are getting sour, when things are getting dull, to look back on those early days when you were head over heels in love with the God of the universe. So he breaks. He sees his old self. He breaks. It ends up being this really redemptive thing in his life. Uh, there's a scene afterwards of him getting out of serving his year in jail and the judge meeting him there and encouraging him to start his life again. There's something about remembering the innocence of that early day. And for us as Christians, that early, those early days with Jesus that could restore us. And it leads to this. There's a train of thought here. Consider how you have fallen. Repent for the church or the Christian that's lost his love. Repent and do the things that you did at the first. 1 John 3, 16 to 18 says this, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Did you hear that? Jesus laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love. Listen to this. This is like a punch. Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. If the love of Jesus Christ really plainly lives inside of you, it should turn into love for the church body on the outside. I meet people who talk this way. I love Jesus, but hate his church. Those two, that statement is not, it's not scriptural. I love Jesus, but don't like his church. No, no, the church is Jesus' bride. You don't say, you know, I love the groom, but don't love the bride. You better treat Jesus' bride with love and respect and kindness. If God has poured love out into your heart, like Romans 5, 5 says, 1 John 3, 16 to 18 says, that love should become love to other people. He's poured his love out into our hearts. Repent and do the things. Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. 
Do the things you did at the first. It doesn't say wait around till you feel better. Wait, do. Repent and do the things you did at the first. Why is that? I want to tell you something, a really beautiful thing. Jesus said, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There is something about doing the act of love that will bring the feelings back. This is a very human behavior thing. Focus on the family. You've heard on the radio, James Dobson was telling about a season in his life. Uh, weeks, months had gone by where he had no feelings of love towards his wife. I was listening to the radio and going, wow, this is an old man. He's telling about this earlier stage of his marriage. This is a cool thing to listen to. Tells about a time where he wasn't feeling anything towards his spouse anymore. And he said in the middle of it, he tells the story of driving home and feeling like he should buy his wife flowers, even though he wasn't feeling it. This is the spirit of God working in his life. Wasn't necessarily feeling about it, but he knew that he should. And he said, I I bought flowers, went home, gave them to my wife. And he said, the moment my wife smiled, all the feelings of love came back for her. There is something about in faith doing, being a doer of the word, letting our love turn into actions that actually brings the feeling back. We know this. You know, you, you feel compelled in your heart to do a, an act of kindness towards a brother and sister in Christ, I mean, the community, whatever. And, and there's something that gets restored and renewed in you as you do it. And, and some of us have got our eyes so on ourselves and so on our pain and all these things and discouragements and disruptions, and they're real. I'm not trying to negate them, but God wants to call you out of your slumber and get your eyes back on him and get your eyes back on love and others and off yourself, off yourself. Repent and do the things you did at the first. And verse five says this, and this is an incredibly strong warning for us. If you do not repent, listen to this church. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. There could be a church that the people have not physically closed yet, but that Jesus has shut down a long time ago. It may still say church outside on the sign, but Jesus has already removed the lampstand from its place. I'm going to say it again. There could be a church that still is meeting, meaning like people are meeting in the church building. But Jesus has left the building and shut it down a long time ago. It's a stark warning. It's a warning to us, you know, in the middle of COVID, where I was talking to somebody today, part of the worship team that, that led, and, uh, you know, talking to somebody and just, we were, we were sort of talking about the reality of some of these COVID things. You know, I, I want it to go away tomorrow. I'll be glad when it does, you know, to just be gone so there can be some normal things return. But it's discouraging to think if, and I'm not trying to belittle COVID either. I know it's been much more serious for some of you, but, but it's unfortunate if, if, if this is all it took to destroy Jesus's church. There have been harder things come against the church in the last 2,000 years than COVID. And the church has managed through it. They've grown through it. They've thrived through it. They've moved forward in faith. They've kept going. I don't want to be the church whose lampstand gets removed. I want to be the church that that burns brightly in front of Jesus's face as he speaks to us. There could be a church that's still meeting that the lampstand was was already removed. And it's incredible. The warning is in reference to our love. Repent and do the things you did at the first. Consider how far you've fallen. You've forgotten your first love. Warning, if you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. We, uh, we, we were so blessed in the early days, my wife and I and her family. We, we have been so blessed. We've been blessed through COVID. We have been so blessed by the love of our church. Uh, this is an irregular thing. We'll look back on history and go, we planted a church and then COVID hit. There's other church plants around that are having to deal with things that they were not trained, were not prepared for. We've been overwhelmed by your love uh, shown to us and passed on to us to pass on to other people. Uh, to bless people in need. People, we, we've been so thankful for your faith and your prayers and your perseverance through this time. And I believe that God wants us to love in an even deeper way. I want to give you a little challenge. Uh, I want to give you a little challenge uh, this, this week. Verse 7, it says this, Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life 
which is in the paradise of God. God wants us to be victorious in this area of love. And I want to encourage you this week, as I pray for you, that God would give you an action to do this week. Not a love and thought, not a love and feeling, that he would give you an action in your heart to love somebody else, another brother and sister in Christ, within the Parkway community, within the greater Kingston, that God would, would lay on your heart somebody to love and bless this week. There is an enormous temptation to settle into a loveless Christianity, no passion and fervor to know and love Jesus Christ, and no passion and fervor to love his church. We started with the uh, Toronto Raptors. Uh, we just read a scripture that talks about being victorious. If you succeed in this, you can be victorious. I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life. Be victorious. Move past this. Love the church. Love Jesus' bride. I was watching the, uh, the final game when the Raptors sort of <laughs> won, won the trophy, and the, the, the commentator said this, We the North are now we the champions. God is for you, not against you. He is pushing you forward because he wants you to grow and move and live and become like him. And he wants this church, the church in Kingston Parkway Church, to become a church that would make him smile, a church filled with love for each other. Would God speak to us now? Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you, God. I, I thank you. I, I read these, these words that you gave to these original churches, these seven churches in Revelation. I'm so thankful I read through them and I see so much love in them. You were, you were so encouraging and at times so straight to the point when they had gotten off track. I'm thankful for your, your honesty this way. You love us so much that you're, you're willing to tell us the truth. And Father, I don't want to be the, the church whose lampstand who gets removed. I don't want to church, be the church that doesn't hear your voice uh, into our lives today. And uh, Father, if there's one here whose fervor and love for you has just cooled off, help them return and do the things they did at the first, to be beautifully distracted by you again. And that that beautiful distraction would turn into love for other believers and other brothers and sisters in Christ, other people in the community. Would you speak to us individually about this? Boy, and as these hundred or so Parkway people, have you placed someone on their heart today? that there would just be this eruption of love and care between all of us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today. Thank you for tuning in. This is part one of We the Church. We'll see you next week. God bless you.